I'm going to turn it over to Sabina. She's one of our therapists here at Blanc Hill. She's really awesome. She's super sweet and you guys are going to love her. So I'm going to turn it over to her and let her get started. Thank you, Heather. All right. Well, welcome everybody to this webinar. I'm really excited to do it. I have to tell you, this is my first time doing this form of teaching. I've taught a lot in the um, brick and mortar uh, classrooms. I've never done this. So um, be patient with me. We'll see how I do. I will, I will do my best. And I hope that this will be a good experience for all of us. Um, just a little bit about me. I am, I've been a therapist for the last 25 years or so. And I've had the privilege of working for Blomquist Hale for the last four months. I'm pretty new here. It's a wonderful company. So yes, do access those benefits. There are fabulous people who are here. I, um, I am this, the uh, designated mental health therapist for the, the state of Utah Health and Human Services Department. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the workforce I, for, gosh, this is going to tell you how old I am, for over, hold on my, oh yeah, over 50 years. <laughs> for over 50 years, I've had many, many, many different jobs. Um, I think I can be, you know, when it's when we have little party games and it's like, how many jobs have you had? I think I always win. I've worked in male dominated fields. I've worked in, obviously as a therapist, I'm working in the um, supportive fields where there are more women. I've had lots of experience and um, doing the research when I was asked to do the research for this topic, women in the workplace, it was like, oh, shoot, I, you know, I've, I've been here for so long. I know a lot about women in the workplace. Well, I was wrong. I learned a lot um, when I was doing this, this research, and I'm excited to share it with you. So, um, so first of all, before I get started, I want to read you a quote from Michelle Yu, who won in the Oscars last night. For those of you who watched it, I'm going to read it to you. We friggin' broke that glass ceiling, Michelle Yu said. We need this because there's so many who have felt unseen, unheard. For anybody who's been identified as a minority, we deserve to be heard. We deserve to be seen. That, that was just really fortuitous that she said that last night. And we women, we're no longer really I'm more, uh, the minor, minority in the workplace, but we are a minority in terms of leadership. We are a minority in terms of equality. And for those of us who are also women of color, that the, the, um, it's been even bleaker. So the fact that uh, Michelle Yu won Best Actress last night was really awesome. And on that note, I was watching the Oscars just for a, a short time and uh, with one of my best friends, Kathy. And um, Kathy quipped when she saw the women who were dressed beautifully. I mean, like birds of paradise. They were just gorgeous. And some of them were quite scantily dressed. And Kathy said, well, how come the men aren't dressed in their tuxedos and speedos? I thought that was a really great idea, but I'm not sure we're there yet. So anyway, um, so this talk is going to be about, obviously, women in the workplace. We're going to look at gender inequality and the benefits of equality. We're going to take a look at the challenges, both external and internal, where we're at right now. And um, we're going to talk about burnout. And then what? And then actually, we're going to talk about burnout before we talk about what we can do to level the playing field. Because with all the dire news and all the sort of disheartening, depressing statistics of where we're at right now, I wanted to stop to end our talk with uh, some, some, some um, positive, some, some hopefully empowering messages for all of us. And indeed, you know, we have come a long ways. We, when I, when I started working back in the 70s, um, I was working alongside men doing exactly the same thing in the entry level jobs in factories. Like I said, I've had a lot of different jobs. And in factories and on 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 those little lines, you know, where you do things, um, and we're all doing exactly the same thing. And the men were getting paid twenty five percent more than I was, and I was told that was because men were um, were had to support their households. Well, these were 
boys my age. And so it, this has been going on for a long time. We still, I'll show you this later, but I'll jump to it right now. Women still make, um, we make about 82 cents to the man's dollar. So it's gotten a little bit better from the 75 cents I was making back in the 1970s, except for here in Utah. That's another issue we'll talk about. But anyway, um, I did want to end this, our, our talk today with some um, hope empowerment messages. Okay, so let's first take a look at who works. We make up, we women make up 46.8% of the prime uh, prime working age workforce and the prime that the ages are from age 26 to 55 and most of those women 77% work full time so that kind of gives you an uh, just a little um, little glimpse into we, we women are there we're showing up it's only slightly less than the 88% of men who work full time um so we we we're in the workforce but we don't have gender equality. So I got this quote from the United Nations that gender equality is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. It's something for us to build on. And there are so many benefits to to raising the glass ceiling or, you know, to, as Michelle, Michelle, you said, to breaking that glass ceiling, to having equal representation in leadership, in businesses. Um, and we have some work to do. So let's see. Oh, um, okay. So let's take a look. We women are in the workforce. We are essential, right? We're capable, we're intelligent, we're educated, we're skilled, we're ambitious, and we have a problem. We are, we are underrepresented in leadership and we are underpaid and we have, we put up with barriers and harassment and things that, that um, men don't put up with as much. And not to say this is in no way against men, not, in no way is this, um, this whole push for equality is not there's uh, no part of it that is in any way male bashing or against men. And in fact, the data is that men benefit just as much as women when we achieve, achieve gender equality and equality in the workplace. So what's going on? How come, you know, what are, what are the problems? Well, let's talk about um, implicit and explicit bias. These are the challenges I'm looking at here. They come from a um, from Susan Matson, who who gosh, she's the Karen Huntsman Chair Endowed Chair at the University of Utah, and in gender studies, I, I might have gotten that wrong, but it's close enough. She, um, I got to watch a a uh, presentation that she did a couple of weeks ago on the, the problems of equality here in Utah. And uh, I've got some of her data later on, but this, these are some of the workplace challenges that she, she put up and she shared on it. And these are sort of more on an over, overarching basis. Later on, I've got some real specific challenges that we'll take a look at. But so let's talk about the implicit and the explicit bias. And in, when we're, when we're doing, um, diversity training, the DEI, diversity, um, equality, inclusive, inclusion training, we, we do talk about these biases and it's the, it's becoming aware of the implicit biases, both by men and by women and by women towards each other, by, by women towards men, by men towards women, by men towards each other, that um, the implicit biases are the ones that are invisible. And making them visible can be a challenge. Um, one of the things that Susan Madsen said that really caught my attention is that when we look at male privilege, in this case, and implicit biases, the training makes people uncomfortable. That's the whole point. Because when we have something that we're unconscious about, and it's not necessarily a positive trait, or it's something that is harmful for society, when we become when we become conscious of it, we become uncomfortable and people deal with feeling bad or guilt or whatever their feelings are. Um, but that's how growth happens. That's how 
um, that's how diversity and inclusion and all of that happens is through people being able to look at their own privileges. Certainly I have privilege as a white woman. Um, and my husband who was a white, highly educated male has even more privilege. So, um, so I was listening to a TED talk. Let's talk a little bit more about male privilege. I was listening to a really interesting TED talk this morning and uh, um, I forgot, sorry, I forgot the guy's name, but it was on male privilege. And he said that when he was in, um, in, a, in the university class on, on feminism many, many years ago, he was part of a, a small study group. And he was listening to these two women talk. And one was a black woman, one was a white woman. And the white woman was talking about the challenges of being a woman, especially in the workplace and in society in general. And she was saying, you know, we all of us women, we're all, we are all have the same challenges. We all really have to work together and support each other, which is obviously true. And we're all we all we all experience the same challenges. And the black woman said, wait a minute, she said, I agree with you that we have to work together, but but I don't agree with you that we experience the same challenges. And she said to her, she said, when you look in the mirror, she asked the white woman, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And the woman said, well, I see a woman. And the black woman said, that's a difference. I see a black woman. And then the white male who was part of this group went, uh-oh, when I look in the mirror, I see a human being. So, so that was kind of a nice uh, way for me to, when, when I heard that this morning, to see that, you know, that privilege is often what's invisible. And again, that's where we get back into the making the implicit um, biases, at least make them explicit because then you can deal with them on a, um, then you can make choice about them and hopefully change the explicit bias. Okay, so women also experience disp disproportionate constraints. Um, a lot of that is through socialization. Women do, I'll get into more figures later, but women do more of the household work. They still do. They do more of the childcare. They do more of taking care of elderly parents. And um, and then there's also biology, you know. So being pregnant is takes a lot more energy than not being pregnant, and and um, so those are some. So yeah, those would be some examples of disproportionate constraints. Women experience insufficient support oftentimes in the workplace, um, and that's prop mostly because leadership is not represented. Women are not represented enough, neither as managers or in the top levels of leadership. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, devaluation, that's a huge topic. Um, I heard a quote from Michelle Obama, who, who was talking about the little microaggressions, that that was part of her, the most painful part of her job in the White House. Um, I think that um, Kamala Harris has said some of the same, so, said, has had some similar experiences and talked about that. Um, that's part of being um, women, women who are in leadership position, even at the very top of corporations, they are often mistaken by those who don't know them as being junior staff. Um, women are um, women are are talked to in in sort of patronizing ways, in way, and in, in those that would be part of the unconscious. Um, probably mostly unconscious approach from both men and women sometimes. And then there's hostility. And that's the out, the the um, the outright um, sexual harassment, the outright um, threats that can sometimes or the insidious kind of threats or sometimes very overt um, actions that happen. and and, they mostly come from men. They not always. Sometimes they come from women. There is a, there is a certain myth in the workplace that women don't want to work for women. That women don't want bosses, and that gets exploited. Don't that women don't want women bosses, and that men don't want women bosses. It's part of. Um, I think it's part of the culture that maybe that was been true in the past because. Um, misrepresentation and 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 experiences that 
that um, that probably were not factual. So, um, so I wanted that I wanted to add something else about the sort of the implicit and the explicit bias because I'm I'm old enough to remember it back. I think in the seventies or eighties there was a question that was kind of a, a riddle that was asked of people and in in uh, in sort of these gender awareness programs. And here's how it goes. It goes, there, a boy and his father are um, driving and they get into this horrific accident and the father is killed in the accident. The boy, the son is rushed to the hospital and brought in for surgery and the attending physician looks and goes, oh no, I can't work on that person. That person is my son. How is that possible? And, you know, so I know hopefully the, all of you that are here are going, well, of course that the surgeon is the mother, right? Or could even be the surgeon is the other father, right? That's now, but back then in the seventies and the eighties, people were stumped. And I suspect I was stumped because there's, there is this, um, this assumption that surgeons and leaders and and that yeah that 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 those are men. Even back then, there were a lot of women who were surgeons, but it was that whole context that people in power were men. So I don't know if any of you remember that, but that I I was reminded of that when I was thinking about this. Okay, so um, I wanted to bring this quote in from Melinda Gates who, by the way, Melinda Gates wrote a book called Moment of Lift that I wrote that I read a few months ago that I found fantastic. The Melinda um, and Bill Gates found Foundation has a huge focus on women empowerment, not only in the United States, but especially abroad. Um, it's a fabulous book. I highly recommend it to any of you who are interested in the topic. But here's her quote. If you want to lift up humanity, empower women, it is the most comprehensive, pervasive, high-level investment you can make in human beings. The uh, United Nations agrees. The data is abundant to support that perspective. So um, we have some really good work to do. And again, we're making progress. We're just not making enough progress. Okay, so let's talk about the benefits of workplace equality. Um, why is this so important? If you look at research from the Harvard Business Review, I guess they um, that's one of the prime sources, at least that I found, about, about what the benefits are. And the bottom line, it's not, it isn't just because it's the right thing to do. The bottom line is it really helps business. Businesses make more money when there's more inclusion, when there's more representation of men and women and minorities. They make more money. There's increased creativity and innovation. They attract a larger talent pool. Employee, uh, there's improved employee retention. The workplace, um, the culture, it becomes kinder. And so people are happier. And so when people are happier, they do better work. They attract more customers, increase job satisfaction. So there's every reason for businesses to want to include um, include gender equality and include bring in more women into leadership position and more people of uh, more people from minority. So yeah, so that's probably, you know, the very practical um, force behind the DEI push that we see everywhere. And again, just we're not there's there's a lot, there are lots of carrots for doing it, and there are still a lot of barriers. There's still a lot of reasons why, why um, we're not making as good progress as we wanted to. And it's not all external reasons. We're going to talk about some internal reasons as well. So, okay. So, like I said, I love this, you know, snail's pace. We're making um, progress, but according to the Global Gender Gap Report of 2020, it will take another 100 years to achieve gender equality in the US based on the current rate of progress. And sadly, as Susan Madsen's research has shown, it's gonna take even longer in the state of Utah. And for other, for worldwide equality, 
I don't know how these estimates come about because I know that in many places we're regressing right now, but um, the data I've seen is that we're still 300 years away from equality. And that's a pretty depressing figure. And I'm sorry to have to share it, but that's the data. Okay, so, okay, so let's talk about the specific challenges. So leadership, you know, I already, sh I shared in the, um, I shared about the, the little riddle about the surgeon, but even recently, and I guess I also got this from Susan Madsen's work. Um, her work is from the University of Utah. Um, it's University of Utah women's, there's women's studies. Are, I, I, I know I have it somewhere in the uh, references, but when um, she's, she commented that when even school age, like high school kids or young people, even young people who, who are much more um, aware of and, and much more ambitious, I think in some a lot of ways in promoting gender equality, if you ask them to draw a picture of a leader, guess who they draw? Almost, I think she said like 80% of the time, they'll draw a stick figure that looks more like this than like this. So leadership and the top, and the at the very top of corporations, leadership is um, it, it is it, there's a huge disparity among um, leadership. So let's take a look at what that is. So women and especially women of color are are highly underrepresented, dramatically under underrepresented in corporate America. Um, only twenty five percent of top executives, and only one in twenty. Of, of top executive, only, wait, let me start that all over, sorry. Only 25% of top, top executives uh, and, and large corporations are women of color and only one, I mean, are women in general and only one in 20 is a woman of color. So we have such a long way to go. This data, by the way, comes from, um, the, there's a McKinsey and Company they do a report, let me see if I can find the exact numbers here, but they do a report on status of women in the workplace. Uh, um, they do an annual report every year where they interview, um, they send out surveys to about 300 different corporations and they get thousands and thousands of responses. And that's how, that's one of the, one of the ways that I'm getting a lot of the data that I'm presenting in this workshop. I just wanted to share that. But so again, so at the top, there are very few women. And at the bottom, it starts at the bottom because for at the for um at the bottom of the la ladder, for every 100 men promoted from an entry position, only 87 women are promoted. So what happens is that fewer women get promoted in the first place. And then there is already this sort of culture of men in charge that starts right from the bottom and men because of explicit or implicit bias promote more men than they promote women it just gets worse and worse and worse as you go up towards the top and so women have a really hard time catching up in terms of leadership okay so that's the leadership um gap the leadership challenge and the, the the corporate ladder and both the bottom rung and the top rung, that's one of the biggest challenges. And we'll look a little bit later about what that does because when you have more women in leadership, as I said earlier, you get more DEI training, you get a kinder work workplace, and you also actually get more philanthropic work. I thought found an interesting data piece where women, um, Corporate CEOs tend to give more corporate money for philanthropic causes than men. So, and they also spend more time on DEI work. Okay, so then there's the gate, the pay gap. Um, um, women working full time. I think I mentioned that earlier. We make eighty one to eighty two cents uh, compared to men who work full time, and women of color make. Even less, and then of course there's in women. Sadly, in Utah, women earn seventy two percent of what men earn. Um, I really encourage you to look at Susan Madsen's work if you're interested in learning a little bit about more about what that's what that's about. 
Okay, so why there, the Pew Research Center wanted to um, know wh why what do people why why do women um, get paid so much less? And half of all U.S. adults say that women being treated differently by employers is a major reason for the gender wage gap. It's not just because they make different choices because they're balancing work and family and they tend to be in jobs that pay less, but a major reason in perception is that they're treated differently. So I guess society is becoming aware of the problems that we're experiencing. Okay, the long-term consequences of the pay gap is that women collect less, less dollars in social security and pensions. And so in a lifetime, earn about 70% of what men earn. Okay, um, challenge number three, harassment at work. You know, in the in sexism, see it, name it, stop it. Um, sexual harassment is illegal. I'm going to go on to the next slide. But it isn't just sexual harassment that we're talking about. It's those little microaggressions uh, that I referred to earlier that that um, Michelle Obama has referenced and that Kamala Harris has referenced and other women in power and that probably most of us who've been around have experienced ourselves. So, but sexual harassment is defined by its impact. The conduct must be unwelcome to be considered sexual harassment. And there are many ways, and you're probably all pretty familiar what sexual harassment is. So there are laws to, um, to protect women and men, because it isn't just women, it isn't just uh, women who get sexually harassed, men do too, although to a lesser extent. There are laws to protect us from sexual harassment at work, but but they're not enforced or else we don't ask for enforcement. And so some of the data that shows that, you know, I'm going to read this to you, that one in seven women and one in 17 men have sought a new job assignment, changed jobs, or quit a job because of sexual harassment and assault. That's really troubling. Um, so, and then the, the, in some industries, more than nine in 10 women say they've been sexually harassed. Um, yeah, I just thought I actually was one of the first wild, uh, wild women, one of the first wildfire fighters, one of the first women who fought wildfires here in Utah back in the 70s. And that I have to tell you guys was an interesting experience. And I'm really proud I did it. It was awesome. Okay, so um, over 85% of people who experience sexual harassment never file a formal legal charge and approximately 70% of employees never even complain internally. So it gets brushed off. It's just, you know, part, unless it's really horrific, I guess it mostly just gets brushed off, but it's that continuing insult that, that um, burdens women and of course the men who experience it as well. Then there's work-life imbalance. So according to a 2020 report by Oxfam and the Institute for Women's Policy, women in the United States still spend two hours more each day cleaning, cooking, taking care of children and doing other unpaid work than men. It's getting better. And, you know, I, I have I have uh, two beautiful sons and they absolutely I well, I'm very biased, but they are they 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 are um, they share in the housework, they share in taking care of the children, and they get upset if they felt like they're gatekeeped and that there is gate any gatekeeping that keeps them away from doing that. So I just thought that's really awesome. I had to share that. And um, I know that that more and more men are stepping up to the plate and especially in terms of taking care of kids. And that is so good for children. That is so good. And I'm so happy to see that. Um, and we still haven't caught up. So we just, but that is moving in the right, right way. Um, the research that I read, and, and this kind of makes intuitive sense to me, is that women feel that women often feel like they just can't do it all. And I think this is more true for women than for men, that when they're at work, they're feeling guilty because they're not taking care of the kids. And when they're home with the kids, especially if the kids are sick or something and they have to take time off, they feel guilty for not being at work. So, okay, caregiver bias, that's really part of the, um, the work-life imbalance, I guess. But here's a, here's a um, interesting little data piece from the Pew Research Center, working mothers with children under 18 were three times more likely than men to say that being a working parent made it harder to advance in their careers. Okay, so this one, number five, this is 
maybe in, um, maybe more than just a microaggression being talked over. And from again, from some of the research I read that this is one of the um, more annoying things that happens uh, apparently is pretty ubiquitous at work. Even the women get this sort of gender stereotyping that we're super emotional and we talk a lot. That's not true in, um, in the boardrooms. That's not true in, in um, meetings where decisions are made and where plans are made. And there is, it's a ubiquitous, from what I read, um, uh, experience for women to be interrupted by, to be talked over by men. And then, because sometimes women, we tend to be less assertive than men, we'll talk about that, but because, because we don't always own our power, because we don't always own our speaking voice, I think men often then, and I'm, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe unintentionally take a credit for the ideas that were brought up by women because the men interrupted, they took over, they get all excited and, and they're off to the races and they develop the idea. So this is actually one of the challenges that isn't talked about a lot, but is apparently one of the most annoying. Okay, this one's obvious, pregnancy discrimination. There's, it's, 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 um, it's illegal to discriminate against pregnancy. And yet, um, it's so it's, 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 it can be awkward. People, the pregnant women, the reports I've read is that they often feel a little isolated or uh, stig stigmatized a little bit. So that one's obvious. Okay, then there's office gender roles. And a lot of this I think comes from socialization and we sometimes take it on ourselves. It's like <clears throat> in, in meetings, it's who takes the notes, who makes the coffee. Um, who's expected to do those. And it's a, it's a real opportunity for men to step up to the plate. I think it's happening a little bit more, but, but here's, I wanna read this because I think this is so relevant. In general, men are viewed as, or expected to be assertive, independent, confident, competitive, forceful, dominant, and tough. And women are viewed as, or expected to be compassionate, sensitive, expressive, supportive, affectionate, kind, and emotional. And when it's the reverse, when a woman is assertive, independent, confident, competitive, forceful, dominant, and tough, what is she? She's called a shrew. She's called bossy, um, some of the worst names. And so there is, I think that goes back into that explicit and implicit bias against women as leaders and women at being successful. Okay, so just very quickly, I wanted to show you Utah's ranking on um, this is from uh, for, again from Karen Matson's or Susan Matson's work. Um, she she uh, from Wallet Hub I think is the is the group that came up with this data, but that based on workplace environment, education, and health, and political empower empowerment, Utah now ranks worst, number fifty after Idaho, Texas, South Carolina. Um, Louisiana is number 41. So those are some fairly depressing statistics. I've seen other studies by um, US News and World Report were based on different parameters. We weren't number 50, but we weren't towards the top either. We were like number 45. So Utah has, some, has even more work to do in terms of gender equality than the rest of the states. Okay, just to reiterate why it's important that we change all this, all of this and make things better. When women have equality and leadership in the workplace, it increases productivity, increases creativity, awareness, innovations, better decisions, um, increased inclusivity and belongingness. Oh, and I mentioned this earlier, women leaders give more corporate dollars to philanthropy. philanthropy. I thought that was really awesome. Okay. It's also the right thing to do. Um, it makes happier families. Men are happier. That's the whole point. Men are happier. So we all need to be working on this together. So let's those, we just went over the external challenges, some of the internal challenges. Again, this comes from uh, Susan Matson, who just, um, she referenced, uh, I think this just got published, the Handbook of Research on Gender and Leadership by Dylan Dubink. Zubinsky. Anyway, so she talks about these internal um, challenges that women face, often because of 
socialization, right? So we there's a huge confidence gap. Women tend to, we, we blame ourselves for failures and we don't take um, credit for our successes. We silence ourselves. We sit, you know, when we're in the boardroom or at, at, in meetings, we tend to sit on the outside instead of front and center by positions of power. We, we acquiesce sometimes. We have um, self-limited aspirations because of self-doubt. And we struggle with work-life guilt more than men do. So um, I thought this was, so your know, self-doubt, self-doubt and confidence, <clears throat> excuse me, studies show that men will throw their hat in the ring for a job or for promotion at work if they feel 50 to 60% qualified. Well, women don't do that until they feel 90 to 100% qualified. We have imposter syndrome more than men do. We have more of a, a need for perfectionism that men do. And then we self-limit our, then we're self-limited. Okay, so I'm gonna get into um, confidence. Well, actually I wanna go back here. Oh yeah, I guess I, I skipped that. I was wondering where that slide went. Hang on, okay, no, here it is. The confidence gap. Okay, so girls experience from the research, girls and boys and girls do great un um, until they're in about fifth grade or somewhere around then. And then girls, as, as girls start to approach um, puberty, their confidence begins to drop. And we're not exactly sure why, but there's a 30% drop in confidence from some of the research from ages eight to 14. Um, and that leads to adult men overassessing their ability by 30% while women consistently undervalue themselves. Studies show that confidence trumps competence for success. And um, so, so when, when, so the whole, the whole uh, Carol Dweck's work on a growth mindset, this whole um, sort of movement, it's, it's in the schools, you've probably heard of it, growth mindset. I think it's especially important for women because a growth mindset um, is critical for building confidence. And then confidence, once we, once we get our confidence increases, then we also increase our competence. And then as we get more competence, that goes back to increasing our confidence. And um, so it's a it's a win win. Again, all of this is a win win. This is not a zero sum game. Okay, I just want to read this. When people are taught a growth mindset, they take advantage of opportunities for self development. A growth mindset rewards striving and struggle, seeing failure as an integral integral part of the process toward growth. A perspective that sees change and growth as um, as possible. So. So um, I think as we work on increasing our confidence in the workplace, that we need a certain intentionality about, um, ab about developing a growth mindset. Okay, so um, let's talk about burnout. And then I'm gonna get into, uh, let's see, what, how much time? Oh my gosh, it is going fast. Okay, so just very quickly and, uh, <laughs> A lot of I, women more than men experience burnout in the uh, workplace. And I love this definition. The, um, in May of 2019, the World Health Organization updated the definition of burnout as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Now, a lot of that is not due to women not managing the stress. A lot of it is that it's not managed in the workplace itself. So here are some questions about um, to ask yourself if you're experiencing uh, burnout, have you become more cynical or critical? Do you drag yourself to work and have trouble getting started? Have you become irritable or impatient? Do you lack the energy to be consistently cons uh, productive? Do you find it hard to concentrate? By the way, these all come from the uh, Mayo Clinic. Do you feel disillusioned? Are you using food, drugs, or alcohol? Do your sleep habits changed? Do you have trouble by unexplained headaches. Chronics, uh, burn, chronic stress that leads to burnout, this is serious stuff, which is, you know, don't forget, this mo so probably most of you listening have EAP benefits. Go take care of yourself. 
But job stressors, lack of control, unclear job expectations, dysfunctional workplace dynamics, monotonous or chaotic work, lack of social support, work-life imbalance, um, consequences, I'm not going to read these, but there are a lot of consequences of burnout, chronic stress. So again, if you're, if you are, um, or you know people who are experiencing burnout, make sure that they get support um, and that you that you recognize it early. Talk to friends, coworkers, talk to a supervisor or manager. Make emotional and physical well-being a priority. So we're, you know, earlier we're talking about changing a whole system, but sometimes we have to move inward. And when we're dealing with our own mental state, we really have to focus on taking care of ourselves. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do to level the playing field, going back to the system of equality at work. It's important for men and women to work together towards um to, because as I said before, men absolutely benefit. And men are right now in a position of power. So bringing men in as our allies, as sponsorship, as mentorship, and whatever positions, talking with men, being collaborative. Um, I think most, most men, I don't know that most, I don't know this. Um, if if men, uh, how many men think it's a zero sum game or a win win? Is that something we still need to educate them on? That this is absolutely good for them, but certainly it's important to get them to bring them in as their as our allies. Um, so some things for us to do when we are at the workplace and to be intentional about is to sit in front and center at meetings. When, you, when you're interrupt, interrupted or you see a woman being interrupted, that talk over piece, interject and ask for her to finish, speak up, stand up for women's ideas. Um, again, women are more likely to attribute their success to luck and help from others, just that confidence gap. So speak up for yourselves as women, ask your male allies to speak up for you. Um, own your, own your power, own your voice. Um, this last one, stand up for assertive women. When women are labeled as bossy or shrill, challenge people who, who say that, whether it's men or women, ask for specific examples and address whether they could have the same reaction of coming from, from a man. Okay, addressing harassment. This is just, um, I thought some pretty, some good strategies. Sometimes it's important to prepare for in advance because we can be kind of taken off center if we hear a, a microaggression or a sexual harassment statement. And to think about like just little things like, hold on, wait a minute, um, we don't do that there. Just have, just sort of practice for yourselves about what you might say. Think about it, um, especially if it's happened to you, it's gonna happen again, it probably has happened. Think about it and come up with a few little, uh-uh, we don't do that here, something like that. Um, address the issue directly. If it gets really, if it gets, if it's necessary, um, document. Um, and well, if it's necessary, keep any evidence. Like if you get nasty notes or something like that, document what's going on, and then go to your managers and get HR. Don't let it slide. Okay. Um, mentor and sponsor other women, especially for senior leadership. Connect women to the right people. Be approachable. This goes also, of course, for um, for minorities. This is not just for women, but we're talking about women. So, but back less experienced women for projects. Be open with your own vulnerabilities and failings. If you're a woman at the top, and you can talk about your own struggles, that will really empower um, women to 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 basically embrace a growth mindset, that it's okay to make um, mistakes, that it's okay to, to not be perfect, that it's okay to take risks, essentially. Also, speak openly about salaries. Boy, how, I don't know why this is still such a taboo subject, but I do know that women tend to ask for fewer promotions, and when they ask for job, for salary increases, they ask for like 70% of what men ask for. And if salaries were more transparent, I think we'd have more data to get over 
that are, are the struggles that we have of claiming our own power. So if that would, I don't know how that's going to work, but I sure would love to see that. Also set up measurable targets so achievements are tangible so that women, um, when there are reviews, that, that um, the data is clear for why women should be promoted. Okay, learn lessons from the pandemic. This Flexible work boosts inclusivity. Hybrid and remote work allows empl employees to be better balanced. Work, family, personal responsibilities is something that workplaces can bring. Um, we're getting towards the end of this, but again, this empowerment, take back your voice and ask for raises, ask for promotions, ask for opportunities, ask for equality, equality negotiate your salary and benefits. And this is hard to do, so sometimes you might want to work together with in women's support groups, um, talk to um, talk to friends, come and see a therapist, um, but own your power. Advocate for yourself. Again, just um, ask for what you want. It's okay to say no. Take credit when it's due. Um, don't apologize for what you believe in. Own your speaking voice. One of the things about the speaking voice that we, we women, we tend to to say, um, I'm sorry to bother you, but, or I just want to. And those are sort of demeaning, that's demeaning language. And so we're being encouraged to watch the language that we use. And I think I've got just wanted, so got just a couple of statements that I want to ask and I'm done with my slides. But so um, this came from a Google TED talk. It's find your voice learn how to ask and achieve what you want in a system that isn't fair and wasn't created for you. Debunk the negative connotations of power and harness it for your own success. Discover how to be heard, seen, and taken more seriously at work by getting out of your own way. Overcome the lie that success is only achieved alone by finding the allies you need to reach your goals and become a great leader without losing yourself in the process. Okay, we have time. We have time for questions. <laughs>